Okay, thanks for coming out. My name is Rafael Paleo, and I'm a sleep doctor at Stanford. I've been there uh, 22 years doing sleep medicine full time. My background, by the way, is in child neurology, but I never practiced child neurology. My uh, interest was from the very beginning of med medical school. As soon as I knew there was a job called sleep medicine, that's what I wanted to do. And I just got sleep medicine, uh, um, pediatric neurology, as a pathway to sleep. My interest was always to take care of just overall all sleep disorders. And I'm a, I'm, I take care of patients. So I take care of mostly adults. Even though I have training in pediatrics, I mostly take care of adults. So I always think of what I do as kind of family sleep medicine. Because if one person doesn't sleep well, it affects other members of the family. Usually when I give talks, there's lots of questions people will have about their own sleep issues or the sleep issues in their family. So I thought, um, instead of waiting till the end of the talk and then you guys ask me questions, let's do it a little bit differently, let's flip it. You guys took your time to come here and I appreciate you taking the time to come here today. I wanna get a sense from you guys, your, the audience, what you guys, you know, what questions do you have about sleep? And then I'll just modify my talk to your current questions. All right, is that fair? So you raise your hands first. You have a burning sleep question. What is it, ma'am? I will I'll repeat the question. I will repeat the question, sir. The question is, do I feel or do I uh, believe that there's such a thing as a biological clock? Yes. We're going to talk about the biological clock, and I'm going to show you exactly where it's located. If you're going to put a clock in somebody's brain, where would you put the clock? It's right behind the eyes. The clock's behind the eyes. Any other questions you guys have? Yes? What are some of the chief myths about sleep disorders? Uh, the chief myths about sleep disorders, the most common one is that um, sleeping and resting are the same thing. I think that's very common. The other one is that uh, being bored will make you sleepy. That's a misconception. Will make you sleepy, yes. If you fall asleep with someone speaking to you, it's not my fault, okay? <laughs> Boredom and sleepiness are two different things, and I'll talk about that. So that's a common myth, okay? And the third one along the same lines in the biological clock is that lunch will make you sleepy because breakfast doesn't make you sleepy. What does lunch make you sleepy? It's not the food. But you will get some food today, by the way. I'm totally going to give you the food after I finish speaking. Okay, and sir, you had a question? Sleep apnea. Question? Is there any other way to handle that besides wearing a cumbersome mask? The question was sleep apnea. Is there any other way of treating that other than wearing a cumbersome mask? And the answer is yes. Yes, there is. There are excellent ways of treating sleep apnea. Uh, and we'll get into it. But the sleep apnea, you know. We're going to spend some time talking about that because it depends on the quality of the medicine that, that's around. And, and there's a lot of crappy medicine. I'm from the Bronx. Am I going to say the word crap? Is that okay? Is that all right? All right. There's a lot of crappy medicine being practiced sometimes. Uh, what, what else do you guys want? Yes, sir. Huh? Is it true? <laughs> yeah. He's like, he walked in with a cow shirt on. <laughs> yeah. Is it true that you need less sleep as you get older? Is it true that you need less sleep as you get older? The answer is no. <laughs> The need for sleep does not change. Your ability to sleep is what decreases, not the need for sleep, right? Do you need less oxygen as you get older? No, but you may have breathing problems. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I've been tested for sleep apnea and was told that I did not have it. Yes. But I had nights that I would go two, three nights and I would just sit there and cannot fall asleep. So the lady's question was, she, was, she thought she had sleep apnea, was tested until she does not have sleep apnea, but there are nights that she stays, stays here and she cannot fall asleep. Sleep studies can give you false negatives, okay? If the test is positive, you really have it. If the test is negative, you might still have it. I always compare it to fishing, right? If I go fishing, if I, if I catch a fish, there's more fish. If I don't catch any fish, there still could be fish. Sleep tests can give you false negatives, especially if you have comorbid. Uh, at the same time, insomnia, which is what you're describing, staying up, because you can't measure a sleep disorder unless you're sleeping. And the sleep lab can be a, a odd place to sleep if you're not happy there, right? And you had a question, ma'am? Yes? The question was if you uh, have sleep apnea and using the machine, you still get quality sleep. If, if it's set up correctly, you should. Right, but uh, the machines might be set wrong, so it depends. Yes? I've uh, seen uh, urologists for years for uh, 
frequency of bladder problems. Got I've it. Had, uh, found no solution. Is it possible to get a good night's sleep on a long-term basis with medication? The answer is yes. The question was about getting up at night to urinate. I'm going to talk a little bit about getting up to urinate in a moment. Uh, we'll talk about sleep apnea. Because sleep apnea makes people urinate. A lot of guys will come here thinking, well, it's my enlarged prostate, but in fact, it's actually my sleep apnea that's making me urinate at night. And if you fix the sleep apnea, you get up less often to urinate. And I'll explain how that works in a moment. A couple of questions over here, then we'll start. Yes, ma'am. How come if you fall asleep for 15 minutes, then you're, right. I, I, I'm not tired anymore for the rest of the day or night. So you're saying, so if, if I may paraphrase, you're saying I, I sleep for 15 minutes in the afternoon and then, I, then I'm fine all day after that. So the naps are refreshing to you. Yeah. Right, that, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, naps are refreshing, right? We'll talk about that. Yes, we'll do the last one. Long-term effects of shift work and that gets, in, and, um, that gets into this issue of the bilateral clock, when I'm talking about how that works out. But people do burn out on sleep disorders. So, how, so I told you that um, I have some training in pediatrics, but I never practiced pediatrics. It was just a pathway to me to get into sleep. It was just, it's a long story, but I was trying to avoid taking care of the internal medicine patients, so I thought I'd do pediatrics as a roundabout way. <laughs> okay, it was a detour. <laughs> and you know, they, they say, they told me that, if you don't like the soup, the parents will feed you with a bigger spoon. That's what happened. I got a double dose of it anyway. But, so I learned to take care of it. But um, my focus was always how families sleep. That's what I was always thinking, how it impacts people. And that's an, this is an old photo you can see. Um, my two children, my, my children are now adults. But I want you to see my mother-in-law. Wait, and um, she's kind of made me think a little bit about this talk. I've been thinking about, a lot about her. her she passed away from Alzheimer's. That was her. And when uh, she gave birth to my wife when she was in her 40s. So she was an older woman in the 60s giving birth. And um, so my wife grew up always knowing she going to have to take care of elderly parents. In fact, she grew up with people thinking that those were her grandparents. So she decided to go to medical school in part to take care of her mother. So my wife was very devoted. and. Um, when her husband, my, fa step, my, my father-in-law, passed away, she moved in with us. So she lived with us for many years. And during that time, we said, well, Grandma's living with us. Might as well start a family. So we had two kids, Monica and AJ. And um, right around AJ was getting a little bit bigger, but, but around that size. She went for a walk. And, my, and she only spoke Chinese, so I really couldn't talk with her. But my wife was saying she's getting forgetful. And we had a little park across the street from our house, pretty much from where, he, where we are here, from my front door to those doors was the park. And she took my son to the park and couldn't find her way back. Kept walking, walked out of our neighborhood, and eventually the police found her, because she was knocking on random doors, speaking in Chinese, carrying a baby, trying to get back. So my wife said, we gotta go to the police station to pick up um, my mom and uh, our son. That was scary. That's a real sense of how we, she could not longer be left alone with the, with the, with the children. And this went on for a while. Um, so, so the kids were put in daycare, but she stayed alone at the house. And I had this feeling for a long time, if you've had this feeling, whenever we would leave, if we left alone, I always had the back of my mind, Am I, is the house going to be burned down? Because she'd turn on the stove, the gas stove, and she wouldn't turn it off. She'd forget. And you guys nodded, nodded in your head. So this was for a few years a regular thing for me. In the back of my mind, whenever we left, is the house going to be burnt down or not? And across, next to the park, there was a, um, a supermarket, a Safeway. And my mother-in-law was in the habit of going for a walk to the Safeway. And she'd always go to the Safeway, and she'd come back with a, a pound cake and some batteries. But especially a pound cake, because her dentures didn't fit, so she kept eating pound cake. Like, okay, she goes, she goes there, didn't think much about it. She'd just come back with a pound cake and she went for a walk and she seemed to enjoy, you know, we live in Northern California, the weather's nice, she'd go out for a walk. This kept happening until the police called us and said she's been charged with shoplifting. And it turned out that she was walking in, grabbing the pound cake, grabbing the batteries, and she'd walk out. She had money with her, but she did not know how to speak English, so she just kept walking out. And at that point, my wife is a physician also, by the way, 
they, they, they said they were going to charge us with elderly neglect for leaving her alone. So now my wife and I are both physicians, and we're now being told that, you know, it's criminal that we're leaving her alone. Um, so, so for my wife, it was a very difficult decision. She started going to assisted living, and from there, she kept deteriorating, and um, eventually ended up in a nursing home. She passed away about two years ago. But she had a pacemaker put in before she ever got um, dementia. So she lived a really long time. She lived with us for nine years, and then she was in the nursing home for several more years. So my son was a baby then, he's 18, so at least 17 years, 16 years of this long goodbye, as you say, right? So I have lived this experience that you guys are living, and one of the things that would happen with my mother-in-law is I, I, uh, when we emptied out her, her bedroom, when she finally moved to the nursing home, I found packs and packs and packs of batteries everywhere, batteries everywhere. All the drawers were packs of batteries. And I didn't realize it, but we finally were talking a little bit in Chinese. She couldn't remember, because we had moved to a new home when the kids were born. She couldn't remember where the light switches were. So she wanted, she'd walk around with flashlights around the house. And she worried that there wouldn't be any uh, batteries for the flashlight. So many, many, many times, she would, uh, I'd be sleeping and there'd be a flashlight in my face because she was walking around the house with a flashlight, wandering around the house. And we never used the alarm because she opened the doors randomly and if you've ever been woken up by a house, the sound of your own house alarm, it's scary. You guys, have any of you had this experience? Yeah? So, there's got to be a better way, right? So, so we, we deal with all these things. So, that's her. Um, she was, at that point, she didn't recognize my, my wife anymore. She used to think my wife was one of the workers at the nursing home towards the end. So, it was very sad. But we're going to talk about sleep. Because what I like about my job... What I like about being a sleep doctor, what appeals to me, I've been doing sleep full time my whole career. Okay, I'm a professor at Stanford. I teach sleep medicine. Uh, I'm, I do this all the time. The way I like it is almost everybody gets better. It's very unusual that somebody with a sleep problem does not improve. Especially coming from initial training in, in child neurology, where you have to deal with horrendous situations, to see a, a, situ, uh, a list of uh, problems where almost everybody gets better. It's unusual if you don't get better. And all of you who have sleep problems right now, if you find that you've gone somewhere and you've not gotten better, we need to find out why. There's no reason you should not be sleeping well. You should never ever wake up tired. Okay? You should wake up feeling good. Right? How many of you wake up tired? It's ridiculous. Okay? How, can, if you go to a nice restaurant, you go to get a nice meal, right? All of you have your favorite restaurant, right? In the back of your mind. Do you leave the restaurant feeling hungry? No. Why do you, feel, why do you wake up feeling tired? It makes no sense. Right? Sleeping should not make you tired. And because I work with kids and adults, one of the best examples I have of this was a three-year-old, I remember, named Eric. And when you talk with children, they give you very direct stories. And Eric walked in, and like any patient, I asked him, why are you here? He's with his mother. And usually three-year-olds hide behind their parents. Eric looked me right in the eye. And Eric said to me, doctor, and I caught my eye, because he called me doctor, because doctor, sleeping makes me tired. I'm like, whoa, doctor, sleeping makes me tired. Why do we tell little kids that they have to sleep? We tell them it's good for their brain, right? Whenever I tell any parent that I work in any social activity, I tell somebody that I work with um, sleep disorders and kids, they always want to know the same question. How many hours is my child going to sleep? What they're really asking is how many hours I have to be away from this person. That's what they're really asking, right? Because being a parent, very rewarding, but very impractical. But the thing with this little kid, Eric, the three-year-old, was he just had big tonsils. So he wasn't breathing well. The more he slept, the more tired he felt. And this ties into the issue of sleep apnea, which is this obstruction of the throat, which we'll talk more about later. Sometimes somebody with sleep apnea is also given a sleeping pill, they sleep longer. The next day they say, that sleeping pill made me feel really bad, gave me a headache. The sleep pills are fairly, don't have that many side effects usually. What happens is, if somebody has sleep apnea, has not been treated, you make them sleep longer, the longer they sleep, the more they're choking, and the worse they're going to feel. So you've got to take care of both things at the same time. You can't just take care of one thing and expect the other thing's going to go away by itself. So if you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? Okay? Think of the money you, you, you spend when you travel. Right? Right? You spend more money in hotels than you do on airfare. And this town people do for sure. Right? What would happen if you did not need to sleep? Right? Think of the money you'd save, right? If you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? So I've been trying to think about examples of how to get people to understand the importance of sleep. And especially when you talk to young people, teenagers, college students, June 29th, 2007 is when the first cell phone came out, okay? 
the first smartphone, the first iPhone. When the millennials are in charge, if there's ever going to be an international holiday, it'll be June 29th. Their lives are on the cell phone, right? They focus on the phone all the time. Now, how many of you use a cell phone? Okay, right, right. Now, do you know how you feel when you leave the house and you forgot to charge your phone? The phone is half charged. The phone functions just fine, but in the back of your mind, you know, right, that that phone is not fully charged. So you, it's in the back of your mind. If you get a phone call, you go, should I get this call or not? It's gonna drain my battery. Is it worth picking up on this person? Right? And you look at it around all day long, who has a charger? Who brought in a charger? And when you find a charger, you go, ah, feels good, right? That's how we feel with our phones. The phone functions okay, but you know it's not at full capacity. Same thing with sleep. You can get by with less sleep. Most of you are getting by with as little sleep as possible. Because you treat sleep like an inconvenience. But the reality is that if you sleep well, you're going to feel better. One of our founders always says that the fountain of youth is in your bedroom. Right? You should feel better. Right? When, from, from getting your sleep. So that's how we think about the cell phone issue. So this is the things I deal with every day at work. I take care of insomnia with an S. <coughs> There's over 20 different forms of insomnia. Sleep apnea. Apnea is just a Greek word that means without air. And it's obstructive sleep apnea. Very simple idea. Area of vulnerability in our body is our throat. Okay? Our throats. You use your throats for eating, breathing, and talking. Think about what you would need in order to breathe. You need a rigid pipe to sustain the negative force of the lungs sucking in the air. Right? Rigid pipe. In order to eat, you need something muscular to bring the food down. In order to laugh and sing, right, to talk, you need something very sensitive. So there's a conflicting functions in the throat. And these conflicting functions is what happens in sleep apnea. When we fall, when we're awake, the throat's open, okay? And then as we fall asleep, the muscles in our throats relax. You have to get the same volume of air into a smaller space. Your lungs are the same size, but your, but your throat is now relaxing. The tongue slides backwards. So when air goes through a narrowing, what does it do? It makes noise. Musical instruments are turbulence, right? So if you'll indulge me, awake, fall asleep. <laughs> You've heard that before, right? You're asleep. And what's happening is sleep apnea. Okay, this is a brain center. This is, we gotta think about how the brain works. The brain thinks it's more important to sleep than to breathe. And sleep apnea, what's happening is you stop breathing and you keep sleeping. For a little while, the brain says, I'd rather sleep than breathe. Then after a few seconds, you gotta get breathing again. You go from a lot deeper sleep to a lighter sleep. Open the throat up a little bit, and it feels better, and then it goes back, back down. Okay? And with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, people do this hundreds of times. And when this is happening, for a little while, you're being choked. If you're being choked all the time, this can actually affect your, your heart and affect your brain, right? Because in the end, it's the brain that has to sleep. It's not your lungs, it's not your kidneys that have to sleep, it's your brain that has to sleep, right? So you, your sleep is interrupted, you get choppy sleep. And I always compare this to car's transmission in your car. If you have a bad transmission in your car, if you, if you know how to use stick, you know, stick shift, if, if the transmission gets stuck, the car can keep moving, but you know you're not dealing it well, it's, not, it's inefficient, right? So sleep apnea is all these obstructions in your breathing. So that's one question. Parasomnias is what you guys are seeing a lot right now in your patients. Things that go bump in the night. Parasomnias are things like sleepwalking, um, screaming or out, acting out dreams. How many of you have people you found that are acting out their dreams? A few of you? Sleepwalking, anybody? Well, just confused in the middle of the night? This is a thing to do with parasomnias. Writing the teeth. Restless legs. Somebody in this room must have restless legs. Yeah, a few of you raise your hands right away. Okay. By the way, restless leg syndrome is related to iron metabolism. So if your restless legs ever flares up, always check your iron status. I've, I've had a couple of patients with cancer that I picked up colon cancer early because the restless legs flared up. It's very sensitive to iron. Restless legs runs in families. My youngest case is a two-year-old, and I see lots of adults with it. Then narcolepsy is a disease that's kind of interesting briefly, our entire lives. You, your entire life you've either been awake, you've been dreaming, or sleeping but not dreaming. That's all you, we ever do. You either wake, you're dreaming, or sleeping but not dreaming. That's all we ever do. And the brainstem switches between these three states. Well, when that switch gets defective, this thing called narcolepsy occurs. And you may think it's kind of a weird, rare disease. It's not. It's about as common as multiple sclerosis. Similar. And it's thought to be tied into autoimmune conditions. 
and there was an outbreak of it in Europe related to um, the, 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 um, the flu vaccine. There was a batch of flu vaccines being handed out, different than what was used in the US, and people who got that flu vaccine three years ago had an outbreak. They developed narcolepsy as a consequence of it. It was an autoimmune condition. So it could happen here, right? But this is, that's, this is sort of usually of uh, young adults, people in their 20s, and it's a lifetime condition. All these things are treatable. I see people every day say, I'm tired. And every day, people come back and say, Doc, you changed my life. I'm happy. I can't believe the difference. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm, I wish I'd done this sooner. This is it every day. No reason it can't be happening here. So first thing, sleeping should be silent. From here on out, forever. OK? Listen to yourselves right now, all right? You hear yourselves? OK, everybody's breathing. It's silent. Nobody's snoring, at least not yet. <laughs> right? right? Sleeping should be silent. Never makes sense to make noise when you're breathing, right? If you think about a very basic level, the most dangerous thing you can do as an animal is sleep. If you're a predator and want to capture your prey, the best time to capture your prey is while it's sleeping, right? When you go out in the woods, you don't hear wild animals sleeping. I mean, wild animals snoring, excuse me. You hear snoring among farm animals, domesticated animals, and humans. Now, your dogs may snore, right? Right, but there's no gorillas out there snoring. They don't do that. <laughs> they hide away, OK? Sleeping should always be silent. Never accept snoring as normal. In fact, snoring by itself may be a precursor to um, cognitive impairment. And one of the things that people tell you is when you start treating sleep apnea, when it's mild, people feel that their memories improve. They feel sharper. One of the first things people patients will tell you, they're less forgetful. I'm not talking about Alzheimer's. I'm just talking about just people in general. Right? You're nodding your head. You've had this experience, ma'am? Yeah, some of you, yeah. OK? There should be no doubt that sleeping is good for the brain. Because right? otherwise, we would never do it. There's a famous uh, early researcher in the sleep field who said if sleep has no function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made. Right? It has to have a function. It'll probably function of the nest. So when I think of sleep, I think of sleep in four dimensions. The amount of sleep, the quality of your sleep, the timing of your sleep, and your state of mind. Do you look forward to sleeping or not? And those of you who are taking care of people with dementia, right? I want you to just take a moment and think about your own lives. Do you look forward to going to sleep? Right? What does sleeping mean to you? And what does sleeping mean to people you're taking care of? Right? Is it something you have to do or something you get to do? There's a difference. Think about when you woke up this morning. One thing is waking up, something different is getting out of bed. It's not the same thing, right? Or you, you may wake up because that's a neurological process. The brain switches to the awake state. But getting out of bed is voluntary. If I ask every one of you, why did you get out of bed this morning, you have the same answer. I had to. I had to go to the bathroom, I had to go do something, right? Getting out of bed is one thing, right? Waking up is something different. Do you look forward to your day? The people that you take care of in your lives, right? Especially if they suffer from dementia, are they looking forward to tomorrow or it's just another day? Are they going to that day center because they want to or because they have to? You gotta think a little bit about it. What is your motivation to start your day? They may be lacking that motivation. One of the things I do with all my patients is I try to find out what they really like to do. What do you enjoy, right? Find out what people like to do. If I deal with a teenager, they may want to play video games, for example. Uh, people who like to paint, play music. I ask people if they have the fortune of being retired to do something that they really enjoy first thing in the morning. And if they don't do it first thing in the morning, they can't do it till the next day. And start that routine. Look at, you have a reason to get up in the morning. Get up at the same time every day. I'll talk to you about that as we go along. But I always want you to think a little bit about why, uh, why you're getting up and why you're going to bed. If you have insomnia, trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep, to point the body the next day, going to sleep is a hassle, it's a chore. People with insomnia actually sleep better in the sleep lab. All the wires you put on their head, for in place, insomnia is often sleep better in the sleep lab because in the sleep lab is a different environment. If I have chronic insomnia, right? I look at the bed, some people in Sunday, they dread the night. How bad will it be tonight? Do I take a pill or do I not take a pill? Do I take half a pill? Do I take two pills to get it over with? Then I'm gonna run out of refills. Let me leave a pill here by the bedside and if I need it, I'll take it later. How long do you need it unless you stay awake to see if you need it or not? And you go into the pattern. So you gotta get a sense of what's happening in people's heads. What appeals to me about sleep is that interface about neurology and psychiatry. Is that, you know, we don't separate the mind from the brain and sleep medicine, it goes together. So in dementia, you have some specific problems. 
the disrupted nocturnal sleep, and this ties into biological clock, I'm going to talk in a moment. Nighttime wandering, my mother-in-law did that, I'm sure you've seen that. The agitation is sundowning. Okay. Um, and I want to talk a little more as we go along. Did they make it less sleep than usual, or did they get more sleep? But the reason I wanted to give this talk today, because I'm giving a talk tomorrow, and I'll talk about dementia specifically tomorrow, but I really want a chance to talk to you folks, the caretakers, because when the, the person you take care of doesn't sleep well is the most like is a very common reason they may get end up in an institution because it affects your own sleep, right? If you can't trust that elderly person in your homes around your around their grandchildren, right, around the house, that's institutionalized. So the problems with their sleep is a reason they get institutionalized. In the daytime, they, you may have help. You may go to a program in the daytime, but who helps you at night? It's on you, right? Okay? And it, how do you sleep if you have to be taking care of somebody else? And how well do you sleep? That affects your sleep, right? So I want to talk to you about good sleep in a moment. Some of the things that, it, that makes this worse in this population are these other sleep disorders, which are listed there. Sundowning you're familiar with. I'm going to move along a little quicker. So I want to talk to you more about sleeping for yourselves. I'm on a personal mission to get rid of this phrase, sleeping like a baby. How many of you say that, sleep like a baby, right? Do you really want to sleep like a baby? You don't sleep that well. You really want to be incontinent? No, babies don't sleep that well at all, okay? No, they don't sleep that well. They sleep very deeply for brief periods of time. Their, their sleep cycle is about 60 minutes. Adults are about 90 minutes. So babies don't sleep that well. Who are the best sleepers across society, across all ages, across the lifespan? Who are the best sleepers, you think? Teenagers? What makes you think teenagers? Do they fall asleep easily, right? Yeah, no, teenagers sleep horrible. In fact, um, it's a sad situation, but lack of sleep among teenagers is linked to suicidal behavior, which is one of those common causes of death, because lack of sleep makes people impulsive. Don't get enough sleep, teenagers are impulsive, in part because of lack of sleep. Number one killer of teenagers in the United States, car accidents. Make bad judgment calls. No, teenagers don't sleep well, but I find that if I give a lecture to a group of high school kids, they tell me that the elderly are the best sleepers because they see their grandparents sleeping a lot. And if I talk to a group of adults, they say teenagers and teens sleeping a lot. And you're both wrong. The best kids sleep we have are actually eight and nine year olds. And your goal is to sleep like you're eight or nine years old. I want you to think about how an eight or nine year old person sleeps and how you sleep. Your sleep is a reflection of your life. Your life is reflected in your, the way you sleep. It goes in both directions. Think about this with me. Typical eight or nine year old person, right? When you want to get a history, when you find out sleep patterns, Start with coming home from school or coming home from work. Eight or nine-year-old person comes home from school, has a snack, and I'm generalizing, of course, all kinds of families, has a snack, starts their homework. They think they have lots of homework. They really don't when you're eight or nine years old, but they think they do. Do their homework, have dinner. By the time they finish dinner, finish homework, it's too late to go outside. There's not a bunch of eight or nine-year-old kids walking in the streets at night. They stay indoors, they spend time with their family. When you're eight or nine years old, you have a set bedtime. Little kids, three and four year olds fight their bedtimes. Eight and nine year olds have their routine down, right? Eight and nine year olds, they go to their room, parents stop by the room, say goodnight, I love you, turn off the lights. When you're eight or nine years old, do you worry about the mortgage or the rent? No. <laughs> Safety of the house, taking care for you. Somebody wakes you up in time to go to school, clothes are laid out for you, somebody gives you breakfast, somebody takes you to school. How old well do you sleep when you're eight or nine years old? Fall asleep easily, sleep through the night, wake up refreshed, run around all day, don't take any naps. Right? And on weekends, do eight and nine-year-old kids uh, sleep in? No. Parents wish they would, but they don't, right? right? Eight and nine-year-olds get up like it's a regular day. In fact, you may have memories, like I do, of being eight or nine years old and getting up earlier because you can watch cartoons. You know, the, you know the, the joy? Remember the joy in your heart when you, when you open your eyes and go, it's Saturday? Remember that feeling? What happened to that feeling? It's gone. And, and it's still there. The wiring for your sleep is still intact in your brains. Okay? There's no reason you can't get to that space. Okay? But your sleep is, it depends on the circumstances that you're in. Sleeping in is a big mistake. And I'm talking about the biological clock in a moment now. So I've said this many, many times. And I said it enough times that somebody in an audience, a, a college student, wrote it down on a, on a blog that got picked up by somebody else, that got picked up by somebody else. And now there's a website that has sleep sayings with this in it, with my name on it, and also includes the Dalai Lama and a bunch of other people. And I go, that's kind of weird. And then just this past December, I was at an office event, a holiday party, 
probably not as nice as the ones you have here, but it was pretty, it was nice, right? Chairman's office. And um, a guy from Lebanon walked over to me and said, hey, he was in Lebanon, and there was a mattress store in Lebanon with my name on it, the same thing. That's so bizarre. You know, what's the randomness of a mattress store in Lebanon having picked up that saying, right? But anyway, it's there. But it's, there's a truism. It's a simple idea. Because it comes to this idea of the uh, sleep dark cycle, right? That it goes in both directions. The other thing to learn about sleeping is the need for sleep is biological, but the way you sleep is learned. You're taught how to sleep. And all your, the people in your lives, the people you're taking care of, they learn to sleep a certain way. There's a biological need for sleeping, but also sleep is a learned behavior. And I'll prove that to you right now. It's a lot like food, by the way. The need for food is biological, what you eat is cultural, right? All newborn babies drink milk, but what you like to eat is cultural. All of you who have a bed partner, you have your side of the bed, the partner has their side of the bed. You ever switch sides to hell of it? No, okay? No, you don't do that, right? There is an exception I've learned, but early on, when you, the first night you get together, you declare sides. It's never spoken about again, right? And when you travel, wherever you are in the world, that's my side, that's your side, okay? Never discussed again. Except for when you get older, and one of you has a rule about sleeping closer to the bathroom. That's the only time people ever switch sides. That's the only time people switch sides. And if you don't believe me, and you normally sleep alone, okay? Rotate your feet, put your feet where the pillow normally goes tonight, see what happens. You may feel, you may actually fall out of bed, right? The need for sleep is biological, but the way sleep is learned. So the people in your lives, how did they learn to sleep? What did they do, right? You would really mess up people you take care of if you change your sleeping environment for them. It would throw them off a lot, because that's something you've learned to do. You learn to sleep a certain way. And the other thing to know is that what wakes you up and everyone's keeping you awake. So you may wake up at night because you're, you're going to go to urinate, right? The prostate, you know, I'm peeing, and you know, uh, you know, you say, this is what I have to do. So they need to urinate, woke you up. Then you lay in bed saying, they said it's benign, but what if it's cancer? What if the lab made a mistake, right? Let me give you another example. Let's just imagine it's a perfect night for sleeping. Everything is just right. You're with the person you love, they're next to you, you're about to drift off to sleep, and as you turn to the person who's next to you, you look at them and say, honey, did you lock your front door or did you turn off the stove? And that person says, I think so. <laughs> Only three things can occur. You're gonna get up and go check, your partner's gonna get up and go check, or as you're about to get up and go check, your partner says to you, no, 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 you know, you worry too much, I'm pretty sure you're off the stove, I'm almost positive I locked that door. You will lie there, and eventually you'll fall asleep. You cannot deny the biological need for sleep, okay? You'll always will eventually fall asleep, but after a few hours, you're gonna pop awake. Go check the front door, and go check yourself. So people who wake up at night and can't get back to sleep, instead of focusing just on what woke you up, you gotta think about what's keeping you awake. It's usually unresolved things in the back of your mind, all right? And also, let me ask you this. Think about your own lives right now. When you're alone with your thoughts, doing nothing except thinking. You know, think about a typical day in your life. When you have nothing to do except to think. For most people, the only time they're alone with their thoughts is when they're lying in bed, right? And if you've got 10 things to do on any given day, and you've got eight of them done, you had a great day. You had 10 out of eight things done. But the two that you forgot, what are you gonna remember? Laying in bed. I gotta take care of this, I gotta take care of that, right? And if instead of thinking, you fall asleep with something in your hands, reading or a tablet or the radio or the TV or whatever, until you crash, the things that you did not think about, that you didn't remember, are still in the back of your head. You're going to pop awake, right? So you got to think a little bit about what's waking you up and what's keeping you awake. There may be two different things. And there's some techniques that we can teach you that we would teach somebody to get rid of these racing thoughts. Somebody stay awake with racing thoughts. Your mind spinning, right? What if? What about this? What about that? There's some techniques we can teach you to stop doing that. And it works. So let's get to this main issue. Why sleep in the first place? What keeps us asleep? Right? As I mentioned before, sleeping is a dangerous activity. Right? If you didn't have to do it, you wouldn't do it. But not only, think about humans a little bit. We have excellent color vision. We have lousy night vision. What hunts humans in our prehistoric time? Lions and tigers, when do they hunt? at night, right? Okay? The lions sleep more than, than the, uh, the zebras. The opposite would never work, right? right? So how do we sleep at night knowing that our predators are active? Right? 
Animals protect themselves at all times while they're sleeping, and we're no exception. We have ways of protecting ourselves while we're sleeping, and I'm going to go over this with you. The easiest example of this is, how many of you know how dolphins sleep? Think of a dolphin's world. Swim fast, avoid sharks, breathe oxygen. Dolphins can swim and sleep at the same time, because one half of the brain sleeps, the other half stays awake. They slide back and forth. Okay? How many of you like to do that, right? Be able to sleep, right? Right? And seals, when they're in the water, they sleep like the dolphins do, half the brain at a time. But then when they're on land, they sleep like we do, both halves at the same time. So the way they sleep is an adaptation to the environment. So think a little bit about what humans are like, right? One of us against a lion, we're in danger. The lion will always win. A tribe of people can take on any lion, right? So the advantage we have is that we're social creatures, right? What would happen if the sleep-wake cycle was random? That you're awake or asleep at any random time? If our sleeping and awake was random, we could not do anything organized. We could not say, let's get together at noon for lunch and learn if sleep was random. We know when people are usually awake and when people are usually asleep. We don't say, let's go do lunch and learn at 3 a.m. No, most people would be sleeping, right? Or maybe not here, but, 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 but you know, you get, the, you, you, get, you get my sense. We need to predict dawn and dusk because we compete with other daytime animals. If you leave the safety of your village, Right? In the morning to go hunt and gather, you have to get back before it gets dark because you can be attacked by the nighttime hunters. If you come back too early, you're in trouble. You're wasting time. If you come back too late, you're in trouble. You must predict dawn and dusk. And the planet with change of seasons are occurring. So what happens is the brain actually regulates our sleep. And I'll talk about that because that was a question you had. So a little bit about sleep stages and how the brain works. Nobody in this room has ever slept eight hours in a row. None of you ever have. None of you ever will. Okay, if we slept eight hours in a row, lions and tigers would have picked us off at three o'clock in the morning. Okay? Humans sleep 90 minutes at a time. All of you sleep only 90 minutes at a time, between 60 to 120 actually, but roughly average 90. Every 90 minutes, all humans do the same thing. They open their eyes, make sure everything's okay, and you go back to sleep. You just don't remember it. Yeah, every night. Go to the sleep lab, you'll see people every night. Okay? Because that's how you roll over and change positions. And there are different kinds of sleep. There's a deep sleep, slow wave sleep. The deepest sleep we have, body's at its, heart, at its lowest rate, that's the first third of the night, slow wave sleep. By the way, it's impaired in, in most forms of dementia, if not all, slow wave sleep. Then there's intermediate sleep, stage two, characters do a thing called sleep spindles. And now, when I first started, we didn't know what sleep spindles were, they were just as curiosity. Now we know that sleep spindles is how the brain is transferring information from one part of the brain to another part of the brain. And guess what happens in dementia? Sleep spindles go down. So the brain isn't functioning right, it's not sleeping right. But slow wave sleep is going down also. And then there's this dreaming thing that we do. The most bizarre thing of all. So dreaming makes no sense. We dream for about two hours every night. Every and a lot of, night. what? Every night, everyone? Pretty much, pretty much, about two hours. But you don't remember. Dreams are not meant to be remembered. In fact, we think of dreams as a way of handling memories. If you remember two hours of the dreaming every morning, one of the things about dreams is they always are fascinating to the dreamer, aren't they? Your dreams interest you more than anybody else, right? And if you in the morning say, listen, honey, let me tell you about my two hours worth of dreams. And then after those two hours are done, you say, now, the guy says, it's my turn to tell you about my two hours worth of dreams. Now four hours have gone by. It won't work. Dreams are not really meant to be remembered, we think. But there's a lot of things we talk about dreams. A lot of interesting things happen with dreams. But dreams cluster in the last third of the night. The bulk of dreams last third of the night. And when you're dreaming, when I look at your brain waves, I can't tell whether you're awake or you're dreaming. The brain waves look the same, pretty much. What's changing is that you can't move your arms and legs when you're dreaming. You're paralyzed. Your arms and legs are shut down when you're dreaming. We don't move our arms and legs when we're dreaming. But now, when people have things like Parkinson's disease, that part of the brain gets damaged, and people start acting out their dreams. A lot of dementias are characters of people acting out their dreams and getting very restless in their sleep. How many of you taking care of somebody with a dementia is a, that person's a restless sleeper? They move a lot. Normally, you're supposed to sleep still. Your brain is very active. Think of all the things happening in your dreams. But if I look at you, you're still. But when you start having these problems with your brain not working properly, you start acting out your dreams. People hurt themselves, hit other people. They have injuries. I've been a legal expert on medical cases. I actually have to go to court Friday, where people have been accused of committing crimes when in fact it was a sleep disorder. It wasn't on purpose, right? If I hit you and I'm in my sleep, have I assaulted you, right? right? So if I, somebody sleeps over, somebody comes over, you, you sleep in somebody else's house, you get, walk around, 
and your whatever you normally sleep in, they can people charge. Uh, you're, you're you're accused of um, exposing yourself to children, for example, in somebody's house. There's been all these kind of cases we've seen. But anyway, one of the things about dreaming is your heart rate accelerates when we're dreaming. Think of all the things you're doing in your dreams. Your heart accelerates. If you have a peak, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, your peak heart rate is when you're dreaming. The biggest workout your body gets is when it's dreaming for most of us. And if at the same time you have apnea, with as much muscles are most relaxed, you're closing off your throat and your heart's accelerating. <coughs> A perfect storm. You're being choked and your heart's accelerating. Less oxygen as you're being choked. And that's why we know people with sleep apnea have increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. Your every insurance company, no matter what insurance you have, will cover the treatment of sleep disorders, especially sleep apnea. It's not because they're nice. It's because it's cheaper to treat sleep apnea than to treat the consequences of entry to sleep apnea. The most recent case that got some um, national attention was uh, George Anthony Scalia. You know, no matter what your personal feelings are politically, it's come out that he died in his sleep and he had a CPAP machine at his bedside that was not, he was not using. Okay? So it's a classic example of early morning awakenings. You have arrhythmias. So so-called natural causes. Why should somebody have a heart attack in their sleep? Plus you get your heart attack shoveling snow. Right? And heart attacks cluster in the early morning hours which is when dreaming clusters also. It coincides. So the so-called natural causes we hear about may actually be sleep disorders that have not been addressed. So now there's more data supporting that. More information on that. But it's an important thing to know. So dreams dominate here, right? This last portion here, right? That's a little bar. Dreams dominate the last third of the night. And I talked to you about dreaming. I talked about deep sleep. I talked about intermediate sleep. There's one kind of sleep that I forgot to mention. Stage one. Your lightest sleep of all. Okay? Stage one is how you enter sleep. It's your lightest sleep of all. Okay? Stage one is characterized by thinking you're awake when in fact you're asleep. You go to any boring meeting, the speaker's droning on and on, you can't believe you can sit here for an hour before you get lunch. The speaker goes on and on, right? You'll see somebody in the room's head rolling around, eyes rolling. Head drops. You sometimes they start to snore a little bit. When they drop the head, if you nudge them, what's the first thing they say? I'm awake. I'm resting my eyes. <laughs> right? I'm resting my eyes. You know they're asleep. No point in arguing. When you're in a light sleep, you think you're awake when in fact you're asleep. A lot of you take care of people who say, I don't nap. What do you do after lunch? I sit in my favorite chair and I rest. But you know they're napping. Right? If you've ever driven your car, and in stage one you do a lot of automatic behavior. If you've ever uh, driven your car, no member having passed some exits, you probably weren't stage one. Lucky to be alive. The reason people, the police know somebody's falling for the wheel is because the scene of the impact, there's no skid marks. Usually if there's a mechanical issue, if you've been drinking, you have delayed reflexes. But when you fall asleep, you go head on, full speed. That's why it's so dangerous. That's why there's a movement afoot to make people more aware of the importance of drowsy driving. But the last third of the night, my point is simply, is REM sleep, dreaming sleep. And whenever you wake up, you gotta go to stage one to get back into dreaming sleep. So that's why I made up this slide about um, um, snooze buttons. We gotta get rid of them. There's no reason to have a snooze button. I mean, the alarm, what's the alarm for? To remind you to wake up, right? What's the snooze button for? To let you know that you've been, your sleep is gonna be interrupted and we're gonna interrupt it again later, right? And what you're really doing is a bad deal. I mean, this is a city built on how to make smart deals, right? You're swapping out dreaming sleep, REM sleep, for stage one, right? If, so, and also, what you're doing is learning to ignore the alarm. I'm set the alarm, but I'm gonna hit the snooze button. If you're using an alarm, use an alarm. I set the alarm last night. I usually don't set an alarm, but I set an alarm last night because I had to catch only morning if I could be here today. So I set the alarm as a backup. Of course, I woke up several times before the alarm went off because I wanted to make sure I didn't want to miss my flight. But for the most part, the alarm is a backup. But the snooze button makes no sense. Don't, don't bother with it. So sleeping is this process, two-process model. We want to stay awake, but sleep is not just based on being awake. The brain also wants to know when it's dawn or dusk. It's imperative to our safety to know when dawn and dusk is going to occur. Right? And we must know what time it is, and the brain measures time. I want to get to this point right now. So what, if, if you normally sleep eight hours in a row, let's say, eight hours, and you skip sleep completely, 
right? You skip sleep completely. You sleep 16 the next day? No. Pray won't let you do that. It's not safe to sleep 16 hours in a row. Sleeping eight hours in a row makes no sense from a biological point of view. How can we be so-called eight, um, eight hour sleeping mammals if you have to feed babies every two to four hours, right? How can you be, be able to nurse? You need a mechanism in your brain to interrupt your sleep, take care of this child, and then go back to sleep, right? You need a mechanism in the brain to allow you to do that, and the brain is set up to do this. So we, we should be able to wake up, take care of something, and go back to sleep. Okay? But if you wake up to take care of something and then you go back to bed saying, what if I don't fall asleep now? What happens? That's what's keeping you awake. So when I woke up, so it wasn't time, like I went back to sleep. I was not worrying that I was not going to make it. It's the worry that keeps you go awake. So a little bit about how this thing works, the brain and the clock. You've all seen these plants that open in the daytime, close at night, right? You put that plant in a box and gets no light. It opens and closes anyway. Right? The, the, the plant is not seeing the sun. The plant is genetically set up to open and close on a cycle. Okay? They figured this out 600 years ago. Put a little box. It's just an easy experiment. The plant opens and closes anyway. First evidence of a biological clock. There is a clock in our brains, and it's completely disrupted in people with um, dementia. So the clock, what it does is, twice a day, we have surges of alertness, and twice a day, we have drops in alertness. We're more alert. If sleeping is the most dangerous thing you can do as an animal, when should you be most alert? Before you go to sleep. Ever notice yourself that you, you know, have um, in the afternoon, you, you, uh, you get drowsy, right, we eat lunch or not, and then without doing anything, without catching any sleep, you suddenly feel more awake at night, right? You have this alertness. That's how the brain is meant to work. Sleep is not like gasoline. Your car is the most amount of gasoline in the gas station. The, the, the fuel level does not fluctuate up and down during the day, right? It keeps steadily going down. But sleep is not like that. Alertness doesn't work that way. We're more alert in the evening than any other time. Your peak alertness is about two hours before you fall asleep. Not before you go to bed, but before you fall asleep. So the people in your life you take care of, let's say, when you take care of, you go to bed at midnight, pick a round number, at 10 o'clock is you wide awake, right? And most sleeping pills that we use only help you fall asleep about 20 minutes earlier. They don't really, they're not that strong. Sleeping pills have gotten safer, not stronger. So if I give you, if I say, listen, you go to bed at midnight, but I said I want you to go to bed at 10 p.m., I'm gonna give you a sleeping pill now, at 10 o'clock, you'll come back and tell your doctor it didn't work, or he acted really strange. Because what happens is, you've given the medication when the brain wants to be awake, and sedated somebody when they want to be awake. And then they get disinhibited, and things, bad things happen. It's a little bit like alcohol, right? If I have a drink, I think I'm charming. If I have five drinks, I'm asleep, right? So where does that disinhibition happen, right? Or somebody who is confused about the world already, and if you give them something that sedates them, but you're scared the dose may be too high, you give them a little bit too low a dose, now what happens is they kind of blend awake and dreaming. They start to hallucinate, and they get freaked out. And you tell your doctor, he had a reaction to the medication. What happens is probably you give the medication at the wrong time and the wrong amount. That's what usually happens, and that's why you get these weird reactions to sleeping pills. And when are we most asleep? When are we sleepiest? It has to do with our core, body, our core body temperature. When our temperature drops, we feel sleepy. When temperature picks up, we're awake. The way to remember this is we fall asleep before we freeze to death. Temperature drops, you feel sleepy. Temperature picks up, you're more awake. Our temperature's at its lowest point about two hours before we wake up. So you might find yourself fighting sleep, fighting sleep, fighting sleep, and all of a sudden you finally get to sleep. And then it's time to wake up. Because that's when your body hit its lowest point. And if you ever stayed up all night, as a physician, that was part of our job, stay up all night, right? We would, we would, you would find that you would be kind of working, work, hitting a wall, and once you pass that point, that low body temperature point, you start to get giddy. Because after that, cortisol starts to rise, which makes you feel kind of happy. So people kind of get, this little euphoria, you get goofy. So you go through these fluctuations and emotions. And sleep is tied into our emotions to some degree. So in the brain, the clock's located right behind the eyeballs. Where the optic nerves cross. If we put somebody in time isolation, and this happens to a lot of people with dementia, if you go to bed whenever you want, sleep whenever you want, eat whenever you want, okay? You get completely thrown off, right? We need to know what time it is, and we need to set, our, our internal clock in our head is set to sink into the, to the sun. In a, plan, in a planet where the suns and the seasons are changing. So our internal brain, our internal uh, clock, excuse me, um, is set up for roughly about a 24 hour and 10 minute cycle. 
So you put somebody in a cave or in isolation, they go to bed a little bit later every night. It's always easier to push away sleep than to advance sleep. Right? If you think about your current bedtime, you have to, it's always easier to go to, stay, go to bed later. Right? Or soon to go to bed later. You can always push away sleep. It's hard to go to bed early, because I told you you get the second wind. Always easier to push away sleep. Logic, one of the myths, is I should wake up depending on how I slept. So that person taken care of or who had a bad night of sleep, when they finally get some sleep, you get a break, you let them sleep in. But that throws off your rhythm. You want to lock in a wake-up time. The most important thing to lock in, to help somebody sleep better, is to lock in a wake-up time. Because the brain is trying to predict dawn and dusk. Whenever the light hits your eyes first thing in the morning, that is the beginning of the day. We need darkness. We've talked about melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that tells the brain night's approaching. Rats, which are nocturnal animals, they have elevated melatonin in their brains at night also. But to the rat, melatonin means get busy, it's nighttime. So the melatonin is not to make you sleepy, so that you know that night's approaching. And light makes the brain not react to melatonin. So who are we taking care of? If you have lights on for them, you're messing up their own internal rhythm. We need darkness, okay? Darkness is key, and then bright lights in the morning. And we can fluctuate somebody's sleep cycle by changing the time of light they get. But the thing is, whenever you talk about sleep issues with anybody, all of you will say the same thing. I tried that, it didn't work. I did this already, it didn't work. The reason is, is that the system we're trying to manipulate, circadian system, is meant to deal with the change of seasons. It's supposed to take gradual changes. Well, if I make any recommendations to you, people do it for three or four nights, it doesn't work by the fifth night to go back to the old pattern. We need about two months of your time to regulate your sleep. Nice, to make it nice predictable. Okay? You want, you want some time, okay? So, that's the, so you put somebody in, a, in a time isolation, they're always going to be a little bit later. That's what I'm showing you there. So the clock is located right behind the eyes. Where the optic nerves cross, that's where the clock's located. The first spot of the body where the optic nerves, where information from both eyeballs meets, that X, it's called, that's a chi, chi squared, optic chiasm. That's where the clock's located. And there's a straight wire from the retina straight to the clock. That part of the brain is usually not damaged, really, in, in many dimensions. Actually, that part of the brain, the brain has excellent blood supply. So if you have vascular dementias, multiple strokes, that part of the brain is usually not damaged. The circle of Willis is there. That's it's great blood supply. So that's good news. Because even though other parts of the brain are being damaged, the biological clock part is probably being spared and other people you take care of. You can still work with that system if you learn how to, how to work it. So that's where it's located. That's a, this is a section through an uh, animal's brain cut this way. The big white track in the bottom. See, I, I'm told about your red. I never see the, the, the light when I, when I flash it. But I see this white line there. Those are the optic nerves crossing. And just above it, a little pink. You guys see a little cluster of pink there? I'm going to do the same thing over here, guys. This is the head slice this way. The optic nerves are these two white areas here. And then the little pink area here and here. You see that? That's, that's the biological clock. That's a real thing. It's not a make-believe thing. That's for real. And because there's a, a, a channel through here called the third ventricle, I can stick a needle in here and, and lesion out and, and take out somebody's clock, right? If you take out somebody's clock, what do you think happens to an animal if you destroy their clock? Only one thing. It's a wake or sleep at a random time. But that's a disaster. So the top line, the top part of that slide is when they lesion out the animal's biological clock and they, they, they wake the white lines are activity, the dark lines are sleep, and it's all random. And then they take tissue culture, and they put a tissue transplant of the biological clock in the animal's brain, and the animal gets back on rhythm. See, that's the bottom side there. And that's the evidence. You, I didn't do the experiment, don't look at me, okay? I don't do, any, I don't do that stuff, okay? This is done by, by other scientists, right? But um, this is random sleep, when the clock is lesioned, when you transplant the clock back in the brain, you get back on rhythm. And that's the evidence that something in your brain measures time. So that was to answer your question, is there such a thing? It's not my belief, it's just a real thing. It's really there, okay? The clock is there and you can manipulate it. And there's four things that manipulate our clocks. Do this with everybody you take care of in your own lives and people that, that you're with. Um, if somebody is sleeping in a regular pattern, by the way, I don't know what time it is, there's no clock. It might, I guess it's time for me to stop. Um, so you want me to, I'll, I'll, let me finish with this. It's ironic, right? There's no clock here, and then you talk about the clock. <laughs> There's no timer. So, so thank you indulging me. The um, four variables that regulate your sleep. 
you take a wild rat, okay, you take a wild rat, okay, and you capture a wild rat, a nocturnal animal, genetically set up to be nocturnal, right, active at night. You take that genetically wild rat, right, put it in a cage, and only give it food when the lights are on, and when they're, turn off the lights, there's no food. Give it food when lights are on, turn off the lights, there's no food. What does the animal do? Initially, it goes hungry, because it's not supposed to be eating when the lights are on. But eventually, the need for food will motivate it to change its behavior. You can take an animal that's genetically set up to be nocturnal and make it behave like a diurnal animal, change the timing of its meals. The lesson from that is your tendencies are not your destiny. Your tendencies are not your destiny. You can change what's going on. So I use uh, this mnemonic. It spells the word self, because you can self-correct. Social interactions exercise light and food. If you put somebody into the same time every day for these four things, they'll get into a rhythm. If you think, well, I'll feed you whenever you wake up because you need your sleep, you're throwing off the rhythm. Social interactions, exercise, light, and food. These are the four things you want to try to do in your own lives as much as you can and the people you take care of. Keep these things in a pattern. Yes, ma'am? What happens to people that work nights? People that work nights still have the same exact thing, right? Right? So people who work nights, we want them on the days off to keep working to, to stay in that same pattern when they're awake. Night shift is hard to maintain when your day's off. You cannot become diurnal for two days and nocturnal for five days. You burn out on that. Some people are better at it than others, genetically. And as we learn more about the genetics of the brain, I bet you we'll be able to pick out who are the best people for those kind of night jobs. People, I think, self-select now. Some people like the night shift. Some people are stuck with it. Your motivation. Social interaction, exercise, light, and food. These are the things you want to try to regulate in anybody to get them into a rhythm. We sleep best when we feel safe, okay? The reason that we want predictable patterns, monotony simply tells the brain um, that you're safe, right? When you are in danger, you don't feel bored, right? So the reason that we have the same stories for the kids all the time, the same routines at night, is they're predictable. And boredom means by safety, and if I'm safe, I can catch up on my sleep because sleep is a priority. If I'm in danger, even if I'm sleepy, I'm not going to sleep, right? Somebody can go fire. So the reason we want routines is because that monotony unmasks your sleepiness. Little kids, when they're bored, they misbehave. Teenagers, when they're bored, they fall asleep. Monotony implies safety. That's what the routines are all about. We've always been telling you, if you look at the brochures, regular habits, regular cycles. Why? Because to the brain, it means you're safe, okay? If your routine is something that you don't like, it's not going to work, right? Has to be safety, right? That's how that goes. Um, there is great research now going on on the idea of how the brain works in sleep, and particularly with dementia, that actually, uh, the brain actually gets washed in your sleep. That the, the brain, the, the, the spinal fluid is being bathed. There's, there's, electric, there's metabolites that occur. Remember, the brain's electrical organ. About 20% of your calories are used by your brain. And electrical organs have byproducts. The byproducts are flushed out of the brain when you're sleeping. And there's some thought now that maybe things like Alzheimer's, this flushing of the brain is not happening correctly. This is a very simplistic thing, and there are great people here who can explain it better than I can, but this is a new idea only about a couple of years ago. This idea of lymphatics, you can write this, you have the handout, you start reading about it, how this ties into this new idea that, is, that sleep is not just good for your health, but actually that sleep is something vital to the brain function. Because the brain is actually going through this cleansing process or getting rid of, of metabolites. It's one of the new ideas on it. And that's just a simplification, but there's more stuff happening with this. Because this explains also some of the other things like amyloid, which you've heard of amyloid deposition in, in Alzheimer's, um, is actually uh, not properly cleared in these patients we think is related to how the brain is dealing with the spinal fluid. So I think we're at, I, there's a bunch of medications that people use. Don't equate sedation with sleep. The gentleman in the back asked about the cumbersome masks. The nature of the question implies there's a problem. Nothing, we never sleep well with cumbersome anything. You don't sleep well with cumbersome pillow, cumbersome sheets, cumbersome pajamas. The question is, can you be comfortable? CPAP, the machine that we use for uh, sleep apnea, has changed a lot. It's, it's a lot smaller. It's now a machine specifically made for women, and the masks have been trimmed down a lot. So CPAP is better than it's ever been. It's actually, we're in the golden age of uh, CPAP treatment right now. The machines are fantastic. But they're probably not set up correctly in a lot of people. You gotta make sure there's something done correctly. 
If, if CPAP is working, you should have zero snoring. If you snore even a little bit, it's not set correctly. It should be comfortable. There should not be any marks or bruises on your face. Your, your sleeping should be silent. There are like six different type of machines now. It's not just plain CPAP anymore. They're much better masks than, bef than, than, than before. And I see lots of patients come in with, with stuff that doesn't fit right. And then they say, well, because the doctor, they don't actually need the sleep doctor. And if you've been told you have sleep apnea and you've been told to use CPAP and it's not working, you gotta go to the actual sleep doctor. Not the guy who sold you the machine. Not, not the vendor. Go to the actual physician and take a look at it. I see so many people who have the masks upside down. It's not set correctly. I had a guy that flew in from Guam. A VIP flew in from Guam because they were retaining carbon dioxide. And what happened was the mask has little valves for, carbon, for CO2 exchange. And they, he thought they were whistling, so he covered up the little holes with tape. So he was retaining carbon dioxide because his mask was modified by him or whoever took care of him. So lots of things that can be, be taken care of. But CPAP is not the only treatment. There are, there are state-of-the-art uh, surgeries available. The latest thing available for sleep apnea is now pacemakers for sleep apnea. Where it actually, um, and I think in the future we'll be doing more of these, but it's now your insurance will pay for this. You can actually get a pacemaker installed in your chest to stop sleep apnea. There'll be a sensor in it that goes to your ribs to sense your breathing, and then another sensor goes to your tongue. The biggest thing in our throat is our tongue. And when you have sleep apnea, what's usually happening is your tongue slides backwards. So what the, sen what the pacemaker does is with every breath you take, it sends a signal to the nerve that goes into the tongue, move the tongue forward, and it keeps zapping the tongue forward. And that works. So now there's pacemakers for sleep apnea, there's surgery for sleep apnea, dentists make appliances for sleep apnea. There are lots of different options for it. But I also see a ton of guys who come in, and sleep apnea is more common in men than in women, but women get sleep apnea too. So I met guys in the general sense, guys and gals. I see a ton of people come in who say, uh, CPAP doesn't work or it didn't work in the past, but when we give them the new machines and the new masks, it now it works. So that's kind of the fun thing for me. I see people who said it didn't work, that's what I like to deal with, because that's a challenge. And most of those people, we get them to sleep at if we find out what's going on. Sometimes what we'll do is have them come in to take a nap with their CPAP in our lab. Instead of just, you know, because you play this game of telephone. You come in, tell me you don't sleep well, you need a prescription, you go to this other dealer who sells you the equipment, and then you come back saying it doesn't work. Well, let's complete the circle. Come back to me with your machine. Let's take a nap in the daytime or at night. And have you sleep there. Let's see what's going on. If I said them correctly. I cannot fit you with a mask sitting up awake and, 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 and assume it's going to work when you're laying down asleep. So there are other things to this. So please, if you had frustration with CPAP, don't be frustrated. Um, insist on seeing an actual sleep doctor to help you with that. Okay? And I think with that, let me see. So bottom line, everybody should be sleeping better. You have the slide there. I think if you see me recharge your brain, we can do questions now. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Thank you.